Call this meeting to order. Welcome everyone to the Committee of Adjustment meeting of February 13th, 2018. My name is Mario Russo, Committee Chair. This is a meeting of the Committee of Adjustment. The Committee of Adjustment is composed of five citizen members who are appointed by Brampton City Council. The Committee is authorized by the Ontario Planning Act to consider applications for minor variances from the provisions of the City of Brampton Zoning Bylaw. The Committee also considers applications for consent, sometimes referred to as land division applications, which includes severing a new lot from an existing lot, a lot addition, easements, mortgages, or leases in excess of 21 years. My first request is to ask those present to ensure that all cell phones and other electronic, electronic devices are turned off or placed in a non-audible mode during the meeting. I'd like to first introduce the committee members. To my immediate right, member Mr. Ron Chatta. To my far right, member Mr. Richard Nurse. To my immediate left, member Ms. Desiree Doffler, and to my far left, member Mr. Robert Crouch. And again, my name is Mario Russo. Seated at the table in front of the committee is Ms. Jeannie Myers, Secretary Treasurer of the Committee of Adjustment. And seated near the podium, we have city staff members who will assist the committee today. I'll now ask staff to please make their introductions. Good morning, Mr. Chair. My name is Elizabeth Corzola. I am the Manager of Zoning and Sign Bylaw Services. Good morning, I'm Bernie Steiger, Manager of Development Services. Stephen Dykstra, Development Planner. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of committee, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Neil Grady. I'm a Development Planner in the Planning and Development Services Department. Thank you. Before we consider today's applications, the committee has some procedural matters to take care of. Firstly, the adoption of the minutes. Minutes of the meeting held January 23rd, 2018. The minutes of the previous meeting are presented in today's agenda. Committee members, are there any questions or concerns about those minutes? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of January 23rd, 2018, as they are presented? Motion to approve by Mr. Nurse. Seconded by Mr. Crouch. All in favor? That carries. We now move on to declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Does any member have a declaration of pecuniary interest to declare on any matter being discussed today? Okay. And the nature? Okay. Any others? Seeing none, we now move on to withdrawals and deferrals. We do have a withdrawal request in writing for B18007, uh, that is the um, 11613 and 11651 Bramley Road. Is the consultant present? Is there anyone in the audience here to speak on this application as well? Seeing none. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Maestri from KLM Planning Partners, representing Bramley Christian Fellowship Church. Uh, our request was to defer the application to the March 27th uh, Committee of Adjustment meeting um, and further discussions with staff and reviewing their report for an indefinite deferral. Um, we are agreeable to that and working with them to bring it back as quickly as we can. Okay, yeah, I'm glad to hear in the sense of sometimes a date just becomes encumbersome on both parties. So this way, hopefully, if everyone does their due diligence, we can get back before that time as well. So, uh, staff? Staff are in agreement with this indefinite deferral. Okay. Any questions by committee members? How would we like to deal with the deferral request? Sure. Yes. So we have an indefinite deferral on March 27th? The March 27th. From what I understand, she's okay with the indefinite deferral request. That's correct. Oh, okay. So, um, that being said, is there... I'm, I'm in agreement with the indefinite deferral. Okay. Do we have a second? Seconded by Ms. Doffler. All in favor? That carries. That is deferred indefinitely. Um, I don't believe we have any other written requests, but I do see that staff has some recommendations. So um, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to uh, request a deferral? The 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Michael Gagnon on behalf of the uh, applicants for A1830 and A1931. These are blocks 10 and 11, okay. the um, car dealership applications. It's A1830, pardon me, and A1831. Okay. So uh, the before staff, you, yes. Before you proceed, is there anyone in the audience to, to speak on these applications? <coughs> Seeing none. Thank you. So Thursday we got the staff report, and I believe it was Friday. Then we got a precon response uh, from the planning department on another application that had been started by a previous consultant that was working on this file. Um, uh, as the committee is, is no doubt aware, when we filed the application, there was a great deal of material that was filed with it, uh, including a, um, a historic, a summary of historic committee of adjustment decisions, no less than half a dozen decisions for similar applications that have been supported by staff and the committee. And rather than proceeding today to try and, and, and force this issue on the committee with the negative staff report, um, there are things that are raised in the report that we have questions about with staff. There simply isn't enough time to do justice to those questions uh, on either party's side. So what I'd like to do is come back uh, after we've had an opportunity to meet with them and work with our client to prepare some additional materials that might help address some of the concerns the staff has to find a way forward. So hopefully this application can be treated similar to the other half dozen that have come before the committee over the last several years. It's the first time we're asking for the request. Uh, hopefully their committee will indulge us and give us that request. Staff, any comments on the deferral request? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, staff have uh, no concerns with, uh, with the deferral request on both A A30 and A31. Okay, thank you. Committee members, any questions? And how would we like to deal with the deferral request? Okay. Uh, motion to grant to defer indefinitely by Mr. Nurse. Second. Seconded by Mr. Crouch. All in favor? That carries. That is, they are deferred indefinitely. Thank you to the committee and to staff. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to uh, request a deferral or a withdrawal? <coughs> Seeing none. Before we proceed, um, I would just like to reiterate for those unfamiliar with the Committee of Adjustment procedure and process, I'd like to give a brief explanation in scope. Following some procedural matters, which we have already undergone, the Secretary Treasurer will then call the applications by announcing the application number, the name of the applicant, and the address of the property subject to the application. The applicant or authorized agent representing the applicant will then come down to the podium, state their name and address for the record, and then present the application. I request that you reserve any questions or comments pertaining to staff report until after planning staff has had an opportunity to do so. If there's anyone in attendance who wishes to speak to a particular application, you will be given the opportunity to do so after the application is presented. Any decision made here today may be appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board by filing with the Secretary Treasurer a completed appeal form and filing the fee within the prescribed 20-day appeal period. Information pertaining to the appeal process may be obtained by contacting the Secretary Treasurer within the City Clerk's Office. Ms. Myers? Calling applications B18005, A18026, and A18027, uh, Jack Group Ball, Harjit Guman, and Shwarnji Guman. The property is located at 66 Mary's Field Drive. Morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Neil Davis representing the uh, applicants. Um, <clears throat> I uh, want to present the application uh, uh, and the details of the application are set out uh, in the report. It is uh, one of the largest remaining lots in this subdivision. Um, it requires uh, 
a variance to the area and the lot frontage in order to uh, uh, meet the intent of the zoning bylaw. Um, you may recall that this area has been subject to other applications, um, one of which, uh, or two of which I've been involved with. Um, and uh, you may recall there was some discussion about the requirement for a uh, uh, 0.8 hectare <coughs> lot size in the official plan. And my application had a sort of recitation of the history of the applications in this area. Uh, but I like to concentrate specifically on, I guess, the official plan policy of uh, 0.8, where uh, these lots will be uh, just about half that number. Um, and that is similar to the other applications that uh, one that went to the Ontario Municipal Board, one that uh, was uh, uh, approved by this committee, um, recommended for appeal by staff to council. Council chose not to appeal. And then the one that this committee, this specific committee dealt with was the Mahison at 20 Mary's Field. And that, the area of that property was actually a little less uh, than uh, the application before you at the moment. Um, and staff uh, looked at the official plan policy and determined that its intent uh, was met. And it did that on the basis that the official plan says two things. It has a lot size requirement, but then it also says that <coughs> uh, the city <coughs> does not encourage further expansion of these estate residential development areas beyond their current locations. However, the continued but limited development of the balance of the areas designated for estate residential either by a plan of subdivision or consent is essential to promoting diversity and choice in housing forms in Brampton. And on that basis, the staff supported uh, the application at 20 Mary's Field, indicating that the intent of the official plan was in fact being met. Uh, and they did that also in part because, <clears throat> and I'll read from the report. This was uh, in December of 2015. Uh, <clears throat> and the report from staff indicated this highlighted statement, which I just read to you, uh, makes it clear that the official plan does contemplate some change to occur in these estate residential areas where there is no adverse impact on the character of the area and uh, went through all the tests under uh, the Planning Act and found they were all met and uh, <clears throat> determined that uh, taking all the criteria and evaluating whether the proposed severance is generally consistent with the intent of the official plan, it is the opinion of staff that the proposed severance is generally consistent with the intent of the official plan. <clears throat> recommended uh, approval and the committee found favor with that and did approve the application. It also that application required variances for uh, frontage, uh, <clears throat> and uh, those variances again were supported by the staff report, indicating that if you look at the area, it's an eclectic mix of uh, housing types and sizes. And if you look at this lot being, uh, if not the largest, one of the uh, last largest, um, it, it will be, even after division, larger than, equal to or larger than roughly half the lots that exist in this subdivision. So uh, I would say to you that uh, uh, this uh, application uh, meets the intent of the official plan, meets all the tests under uh, 5124. Uh, it is no different than what this committee approved and what staff supported at 20 Mary's Field. And uh, it uh, meets the four tests for the variance uh, uh, reduction. Uh, they, uh, if you look at the depth of the lot, they're very deep lots. And uh, uh, is, uh, in my opinion, supportable if you look at uh, the character of the area. Thank you. Um, you raised some good points. I just want to also then bring to the attention, and, and for the record, there is a um, comments from the TRCA that are also uh, stating 
a deferral uh, request uh, from their point of view. So I just wanted to put that in for the record as well. And I guess then proceeding, is there anyone in the audience here to speak on these applications or on this specific application? Sir? Good morning, Chair and uh, committee persons. Um, my name is Amato Nesturzio. I live at 74 Marysfield Drive, and I support this application. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Ma'am? Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Mary Lorber, and I live on 70 Marysfield. I'm right next door on the uh, north side of the property. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm not against it. It's just I want the trees protected if, by any possible means. Okay. Because <clears throat> along the border, we have all mature cedar trees, and in the front, and it gives privacy, and this is what I would like that we obtain that because I find uh, a house is nothing without uh, the greenery. Okay. Thank okay? you. And perhaps the, the consultant and, and or the staff may be able to answer uh, how that may be attained. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else like to comment on here to speak on these applications? Seeing none, staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, on Wednesday of, of, um, of last week, City Council uh, enacted an interim control bylaw. And to assist the committee, um, staffs attached the report transmitting that interim control bylaw. And uh, this, this property and other properties, for that matter, are, are affected by the, by the interim control bylaw. Um, staff was directed in, um, a number of years ago to start to initiate, and that study has been initiated, um, uh, this particular unique um, subdivision. It's called the Toronto Gore Density Policy Review. And that study was initiated due to a number of ongoing pressures for severances in the neighborhood. And there was filing of a number of, of consent to sever applications and associated minor variance applications, as um, Mr. Davis has touched upon. The interim control bylaw is, is specific, and it's intended to ensure that any new development and severances do not occur while the review and study is underway, uh, as the approval of those consent to severs and uh, minor variance applications may, may uh, undermine that policy review. The interim control bylaw would be in effect for a one-year period of time, and it is subject to, to extensions uh, as well, Mr. Chairman. So in, in, light of, in light of that reality, it uh, is staff's recommendation that this application, the Associated Committee of Adjustment Minor Variance applications, uh, be deferred indefinitely. Any questions by committee members to staff? Any comments, Mr. Davis? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, that uh, to, to go back into the background a little bit, and if you read the uh, interim control bylaw, there's no doubt that it, <coughs> in, in my opinion, is being prompted by our applications. If you look at the date of passage, it was uh, literally last week. Um, and <coughs> so it's being directed to deal with the applications and try and uh, go and have a policy review, quite frankly, before you are given an opportunity to deal with the applications. And uh, in my submission, that is not appropriate. Um, the suggestion of a study was in 2011, and Mrs. Lorber was here. It was, uh, uh, and I was representing that application. And uh, that application, <coughs> um, just again, uh, for uh, the history of it, was the application immediately adjacent. It was divided in a little different circumstance where the front was divided from the back and there was a frontage of about 13 feet, quite frankly, on Mary's Field going into to, uh, a uh, larger home at the back of the property. <coughs> and staff had, at the committee, uh, opposed the application. 
um, and they took that opposition um, by way of an appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board. Um, and this was in 2011. And a report was written to Planning Committee uh, by the Commissioner of Planning of the day, John Corbett, saying that um, we think you should appeal but, uh, or support our appeal, affirm it, because they'd already made it. Uh, but if you don't, we think you should do a study of Mary's Field because it's different than um, uh, some of the other estate residential areas. So in uh, committee nor council chose to support staff's uh, appeal. And so the application was approved. And then <clears throat> no study was commenced in 2015 when you had for you 20 Mary's Field that I've spoken about. There was no reference to a study needing to be done uh, at that time. Um, in fact, staff supported uh, the application before the committee. Um, and so to uh, six plus years later, say we're gonna now study something where the recommendation had been made in 2011 to do the study and in 2015, they ignore the advice of having a study done and approve of uh, almost an identical application in this area. I think it is uh, uh, truthfully unfair and bad faith to say we now want to set up a new policy regime for this application to be heard. Uh, these applications should be heard under the policy regime that exists. I understand that at the end of the day that um, <clears throat> We cannot get a building permit for this, but you can do your job in terms of determining the appropriateness of the severance and the variances, <clears throat> and the uh, st uh, staff will have to support their uh, interim control bylaw process uh, at, at, uh, through an appeal um, and determine whether or not it was a fairly uh, constituted process and the outcome of that, whether it will have any impact on this application is clearly in doubt because you are entitled to have your application heard in accordance with the policy regime at the time you submit. And so that is my request of the committee is that uh, the committee do hear and determine the application and um, that uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, should be able to be entitled uh, to rely upon the policy regime that sits there. Uh, it's not fair six years later to say well, now we want to do the study now that you brought two other applications forward. Any other comments or questions by committee to the <coughs> agent? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair of Staff. Why has the study not yet been commenced? The study is underway, and that's the main reason that we are recommend we passed the ICBL and are recommending deferral of this application is so that we can assess this. So, um, so the gap between 2015 and now is I can't a fully explain that. Gap. Yeah. So okay. as part of the, the Toronto Gore review was underway, and part of that is a study for the Marys Field area. And given that context, staff do not feel that it's appropriate to um, deal with the severance application. The ICBL was reviewed by our legal team and found to be appropriate and found and found to be an appropriate tool to uh, deal with development in general terms in Mary's fields. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd be most reluctant on this panel to uh, disrupt the decision just made last Wednesday by council. I tend to agree. It's, it's difficult uh, from my perspective to to support with all, um, all the information and if there are other things that do come up in, in particular with also the TRCA and, and, and Council's decision. Uh, it puts, from my perspective, a difficulty in, in even respecting some of the points that Mr. Davis brought up, but it's just uh, not enough info from, from my perspective as well. So any other comments or questions? If not, seeking a motion to proceed. I would move to refuse all applications with respect to 66 Marysville. Move to refuse. 
Hmm? Move to refuse. Move to refuse. Okay. Do we have a second there? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I just ask one clarification? Sure. May I ask when the application was made? It was made three weeks or so ago, I believe. And has the application been um, considered to be made for some time or also recently? Uh, yes, uh, we had the complication of uh, doing these applications to get the uh, uh, surveying done to uh, um, make sure that we have all of the information for the committee that it needs. Um, and uh, uh, so the answer is yes, but we uh, made the application, on both applications, you'll hear another uh, next. Um, once uh, we had all the detailed surveying information that was uh, needed to put before you. There was some confusion, quite frankly, because the one lot that's in front of you at the moment has this arc, and we were told to measure a certain way, and then we were told we shouldn't measure that way, and so things had to get changed. So things were delayed somewhat, uh, but anyway, it was submitted. But uh, there, it, uh, I... I will say that I think it's these two applications that have prompted the study to be done. And the intent clearly is to look at a policy regime. If you read the report, it clearly looks like they want to bring clarity around the official plan. And to set new rules for an application that's before you is not fair. But I, I, I'm not going to try and convince you of I mean, I am, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, uh, um, and, and I, it, it, it's how the process works. Um, but just so you know, we, we aren't given notice or an opportunity to say to council that we have these applications in front and here's what's different about what we're doing here. We weren't given that opportunity. We were simply, literally last Friday, I think, presented with uh, the information that uh, these had been passed. Yeah, and, and respecting that and difficulty lies even from, from my point of view as well, or, and, and I can't speak on all the committee members, is that we can't make the assumption that it was put in place because of these applications, even though it may seem to be and, and it can be argued either way. It's just very difficult to rely on that in particular when there are other factors that come into that equation. But it's, it's uh, understood from your perspective as well. Sure. So we do have a motion um, before us to uh, refuse the application and I believe a second there. Um, so I'll bring forward the question. All in favor? Three to two, that does carry. Thank you. And obviously you do have the ability to uh, appeal. appeal as well. With a few second. things. <laughs> In term control bylaws. Applications B eighteen zero zero six, A eighteen zero two eight, and A eighteen zero two nine. Monica Bargewaz. The property is located at fifty two Marysfield Drive. So, so Mr. Chairman, um, I, rather than um, giving you the substantive case for 52 Marysfield, and I, I can uh, briefly say that it follows the same reasoning. It has, uh, it's a lot that again is one of the largest in the subdivision, um, is immediately adjacent to the Kachik application uh, uh, that was heard by the Ontario Municipal Board and pro approved um, two lots uh, immediately beside, um, and it was that Ontario Municipal Board that said, these lots were appropriate. It's an eclectic mix of lot uh, types, uh, house types, uh, lot frontage sizes, and uh, areas. 
um, and determined that you know roughly half the subdivision um, was smaller um, than that, and that is true in this case as well. Um, and the frontages in, in this case are equal to or greater than uh, 20 Maris Field that you approved. So I am putting before you that again, I think uh, on the issue of meeting official plan policy that exists today, that staff determined uh, 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 was met in an application that is virtually identical and that this committee supported that uh, the OP was met and that all other tests under 5124 were met there. They're also met here. Um, and that on the variances uh, before the committee, um, the, the frontages are, as I said, uh, essentially equal to or greater than the 20 Mary's field that you already approved. Um, and again, uh, the staff uh, found that uh, those frontages were uh, meeting the intent of uh, the zoning bylaw, minor, desirable, and appropriate. Uh, in meeting the intent of the official plan. So all four tests were met in that circumstance. So again, um, faced with the staff report, I think uh, you, you can read it, uh, but it's essentially the same, um, that they are seeking a deferral because uh, the council has passed an interim control bylaw. So um, I'm not assuming they'll be much different in the outcome of this, but I am putting the application before you because we're entitled to have this matter heard under existing policy. Thank you, sir. Um, any questions by committee members to the agent? Uh, again, just for the record, we do have TRCA's comments again. Um, can I can I just speak to that? Because I, I, if that was the only issue, then I, I would have spent more time. But yeah. honestly, TRC has not been to the property. But if you look at the air photo, we are uh, several hundred feet from any implication of um, uh, TRCA. Um, so it's a matter of them not having had an opportunity to see it, I would have no issue with a condition so that we could hear the application, a condition that uh, the building envelope be approved at the end of the day by TRCA. Um, so I, I just don't want that I, uh, to be the stumbling block because it, if you look at how deep these lots are and where the uh, environmental constraint is, it is nowhere near where the, lot, uh, the building envelope would be for either of uh, the two properties. Yeah, and, and understood, and sometimes there's kilometers between things in TRCA, so I just wanted to just put that in just for the record that they yeah. have sent that letter in, and we're just relying on what their comments are at this point in time, so understood yeah. on that. From yeah, on that one, I just think I could address it for you, but I think you, you, you've uh, uh, made your position on, on what council has done, and that, uh, that, that uh, is holding sway over how you feel you need to deal with the application. So on that basis, I just didn't want to leave TRCA un untouched. Yeah. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that's here to speak on these applications? Seeing none. Staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? Um, Mr. Chairman, members of committee, um, staff's position is uh, identical to uh, to the position in, in, uh, that we uh, we took with uh, consent application B18005. In light of the interim control bylaw being in place, and in light of this ongoing uh, study, our recommendation is to defer the consent application, and the associated minor variance applications, indefinitely. Thank you. Any questions or comments by committee to staff? a comment out of respect for the agent and the applicants were it not for this uh, information that came to light um, I personally would have uh, been fine with supporting both applications I'm only making a comment because I feel it's a little bit harsh in how this has come down and the fact that uh, only Friday did you receive the notice so uh, I, I don't know that what other process there could have been but I just wanted to offer my respect to both yourself and the applicants. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, seeking a motion to proceed. Motion to refuse. Motion to refuse by Mr. Crouch. Seconded by Mr. Nurse. All in favor? That carries three to two. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Calling application A17208, Abinesh Baines and Devinder Baines. The property is located at 31 Crocker Drive. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee and the staff. Just like to state your name and address just for the record, sir. My name is Abinash Benz, 1131 Crocker Drive, Brampton. Okay. A any details to the application, sir? Yes, sir. I, I applied for in July to the driveway business. So I applied three feet on each side according to the website. Like they said, if you have a 60 feet lot, you can apply for that. And I seen some houses in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They already get approved for that too. And uh, that's why I applied it. And they permit me to cut the curb on right side of my driveway, only one side. And they give me the list of people who cut the curbs. The city give me list. So I call one of them and show him the permit. And they said on the right side, I thought the right side when you standing on the house and right side. And the guy did the same thing. He got on the right side. Then I got a call from city. They said, you cut the wrong side. You should see on the road, stand on the road, then you see the right side. So they, then I find the solution to apply for the committee of adjustment. Okay. So I, I understand from your perspective the confusion, but the contractor, did you ask them I show him this permit, and I show him the permit. The guy came in, and he looked on that and cut it. Okay, I'll ask some other questions. Yeah, that was the mistake between like him and us. And <coughs> Any other points or anything else for the uh, application right now? From your perspective? Okay. Any questions by committee members to the owner? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, the contractor told you that he couldn't cut the appropriate side of the driveway but no, no, because he it was didn't too say close that. to an electrical box? No, he didn't say that he can't cut that side. He just, I show him the paper and I told him we are allowed to cut on right side. So he never, maybe he had a confusion and he cut the right side. 
from your perspective, the right side was when you were standing on your porch as right. opposed to when you're looking at the right. house. Right. And I understand from your perspective, I just, the contractor should have known better from That's my right. perspective. That's what right. my right. question, yeah. Okay. Any other? Any other questions by committee members at this time? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience here to speak on this application? I had a neighbors on, <coughs> on my left side, and I had a porch going, uh, pathway going to the pond behind my house. Mm -hmm. And the other side, I the neighbors, they gave me, like in the riding, they had no problem Letter. with any issues. Would you like to just submit that to Ms. Myers? They, are, they both had work today. Okay, so that's fine, they, thank they you. Just, uh, to you, uh, yes. Uh, to the applicant, uh, the third, uh, the third variance is uh, regarding that gazebo in your backyard. Yes. Uh, is that I, something you put recently, or no? How that came in the picture? I, I bought my house in 2003, and 2004 or five, I think, I applied for the deck in my build the deck in my backyard. So I applied with the city. So I built the deck with the fully permission with the city. That time I built my gazebo and I asked city, do I need a permit? They said if it's minimum, like a small uh, size of the gazebo, you don't need a permit that time. So right now they said my gazebo is right on the boundary. I supposed to have some like two feet or but there's no house in the back or the side, like, that's all. That so was a mistake when we built. The gazebo is, is a permanent structure, it's not? No, it's not permanent. They said you don't need for small. That time they, they told me. So is it, uh, like, did you that build it or was it one of those ones that you purchased from like a big box stores? That's why yes, it was difficult for us to get to the backyard because of the snow. That's one of the questions So I just tried to do from from uh, an aerial view? No, it's like, uh, yeah, it's a small build up, like uh, nine feet, uh, eight to nine feet size wise. Okay. Like, yeah. I'll ask some questions in the yeah. staff as well. Okay, thank you. thank you. Any other comments? No one in the audience here to speak on this application again? No? Staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, it, yeah, it's understood that the uh, this application and the variances came about due to the cutting of the curb. When the curbs were cut then, uh, then there was uh, variances that were required or it didn't uh, meet the zoning bylaw, uh, specifically with the uh, depth of the driveway and as well for the, um, uh, the, the landscaping ad adjacent to the uh, side uh, lot line. Uh, <clears throat> with respect to the uh, driveway depth uh, staff are not in support of uh, the reduction in the uh, uh, driveway depth and uh, the, the reason behind that is uh, essentially it allows for cars to be parked in front of the living space of the house and that's not really the intent of the of the lot and the design of the house and uh, with the um, uh, with the reduction of the uh, driveway depth, <clears throat> you're essentially allowing three vehicles to be parked in, in front of the house, whereas the intent is only to have two vehicles parked in front of the house. Um, <clears throat> with uh, understanding, uh, to answer some questions about the gazebo, uh, the gazebo uh, d does not require a, a building permit, so the, the applicant is correct in that. However, it does have to comply with the zoning bylaw, so um, so while he doesn't need necessarily a building permit for that, he, he does, the the, um, the gazebo does have to um, abide by the zoning bylaw, which does require uh, yeah like about a two foot uh, setback from the property line. Um, behind the property is uh, city owned lands, uh, so those city owned lands would be uh, again impacted by the. Um, uh, by the the rain and all the drainage from drainage from the gazebo. 
Uh, staff are in support of the reduction of the permeable uh, landscaping adjacent to the side lot line uh, from essentially two feet down to about a foot. Um, and the rationale behind that is uh, because of the, uh, the adjacent parcel, it does have significant amount of landscaping. And uh, we understand that uh, uh, while we're while staff are not in support generally of, of widening of driveways in this particular case, um, it's not necessarily uh, our, our position is we do not want to have additional cars parked in front of the area. However, um, uh, this, this minor amount of space would not allow for an additional car to be parked there. And uh, we also have um, information from engineering that says there's, uh, there would be no uh, detrimental effect to the uh, permeable landscaping and the, the engineering for the site in the reduction from the two feet down to the one foot. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sir, so I just have a, <coughs> a few questions. Um, one, in terms of the space of the gazebo, uh, are we taking that from the wall or from the overhang, just so that we're clear on that? I the measurement is taken from the wall of the gazebo. So it's ad adjacent to the fence as uh, That's current. correct. Okay. And then in the, um, going through your conditions, um, I kind of have a few questions, in particular to condition five. I can't make heads or tails out of that yeah. one. So I just want to kind of get some clarity on what 30 square meters is referring to so that that's a comment that was brought to us by our open space group and uh, that's that's really to protect the um, the tree uh, so that the, the street tree that's in front of the house and okay I'm I have the pictures in front of me I which tree are, I don't see any trees there that's why I'm uh, so there's a tree in in front of um, I'm, I'm not sure which which pictures you have in front of you, but there is a okay. So it should be <clears throat> uh, essentially just to the between the pathway and the driveway. There's uh, there's a small landscaped area. So th the driveway and the pathway. There's a small landscaped area there, which okay. uh, which has a tree in there. It's a, it's a very small space. This is not referring to. This is on on. Private property, not city property. No, it, uh, it's on. Or a combination of, I guess, depending on where the lot line ceases. But it, it's on the other side of the driveway, not on the boulevard side. I, I'm reading from, or I'm hearing from our uh, uh, zoning that, no, it's in fact on their, on their property. However, it is identified on the landscape plans for the... Uh, for the subdivision, and it would have been, it's the intent to keep and retain that tree for, uh, on that property. So in order it, to, to answer your question about the, the, um, uh, that, that condition, the, uh, the open space and our environmental planning group have come up with a general number uh, of about 30, 30 square meters of, uh, soft, uh, soft, uh, surface landscape area in order to maintain the health and well-being of a tree. Um, if you essentially it means like if if you have hard surface area around the entire tree, you're not allowing it to uh, thrive and, and for it to have a healthy uh, healthy life. So um, with all of the hard surface around that tree. Um, you're not allowing that tree to have the ability to, to have a long life. And, and that's why uh, we are suggesting, or we're, our recommendation is to ensure that there is enough space around that tree um, with cars not parking on it, with uh, hard surfaces potentially being removed from that area in order to you know, uh, ensure that that tree, which was intended for that property, will actually be um, uh, able to survive. Okay. Yeah, and again, from my perspective, understanding the philosophy behind it, it's just, it's on, it seems to be on private property, and this number just seems pretty cumbersome to actually deal with, in, in particular when you have trees on boulevards that tend to be two feet. That's where it's, it's just difficult. I just, it's, I've never seen this condition in a 
residential application. So it's just it's, seems yeah. So the, the thirty meters is uh, not all in the. Um, uh, it can it can be within a general area of it. So there can be some hard surfaces okay. within it, within that area, but you know within the tree root system that it has within the tree root system, which expands uh, potentially beyond the uh, that pathway to the house, it has the ability to to uh, um, gather more rain and whatever nutrients it needs. Okay, and and then my last comment is pertaining to condition four, which I understand entirely, um, other than the fact that if we seek or tend to agree with um, variance, not supporting variance one, is putting that condition in there really necessary? Uh, it is, in fact. The reason why the condition is there um, is because when zoning staff attended the site, the area of paved surface between the front porch and the landscape feature is greater than six feet in depth, so you can physically pull a car over and then again down the pathway on the okay. other side of the tree. Uh, so to prevent that from happening and to avoid having to have a variance for driveway width, as well, which they don't have here. It's just for the permeable. To avoid the variance for driveway width, they are proposing a, a landscape feature that's permanently affixed to prevent a car from parking perpendicular. Okay. Yeah, and, and I, I, I agree with the with the actual condition. It's just some. It's if we don't agree with the with the actual variance, right. oftentimes there's no need to put in that condition. But I guess you're referring to it's in order to protect that exactly. another variance isn't necessary. Exactly. Okay. All right. Those are my questions. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, looking at the picture of the elevation in the tree, so that tree is in the boulevard, notwithstanding it's set back from the sidewalk. Um, where did the figure 30 square meters come from? It seems like quite a large spot, and I'm just trying to figure figure out how the applicant would comply with that. Through the chair, through the chair to uh, Member Crouch. Um, again, that night. That 30 square meters uh, came from uh, our open space development uh, group. Um, that was, this is a number that they've now generally started to use in terms of how much area is required for a, a tree to survive a, a healthy, yeah. Mr. Steiger? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, if, if the committee is considering this, um, Staff would be amenable just to have that adjusted so that a minimum soft surface take the number out effectively and just simply say to the satisfaction of our open space development. So that may mean that there be maybe a lower number that's satisfactory to their group in the end, and that may <coughs> provide some greater flexibility. Um, well, I certainly understand why that a tree will choke itself if it doesn't have enough uh, yeah. open uh, open permeable ground and uh, has vehicle weight on it. I'm losing one in my front yard on account of that. Um, but again, uh, I do have trouble picturing where 30 square meters is going to be found, even if we deny the uh, hard surface request for a variance. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Stoffler? Good morning, Mr. Chair. In terms of the gazeta, I was able to get down to take a look at it. Um, I couldn't get close to it and I couldn't get in behind it from the city property because the gate wasn't opening for me to get back there. Um, however, based on what I saw, the gazebo itself appears to be two feet away from the fence, but there's a bench that is sitting <coughs> against the fence and it's attached to two posts of the gazebo. So based on what I saw, uh, if that bench were removed, uh, there are also some uh, pavers which are just laid down, small pavers that could be removed and I think it would be two feet away from the fence. Yeah. And, and again, from my perspective, um, seeing that there are no other homes behind, it's, it's from my perspective, it's rather minimal, but again, the committee can uh, decide on, on those variables as well. Yeah. And just in terms of the overhang through you, Mr. Chair. It's um, not overhanging, this is, sorry to interrupt you. It's not overhanging to the, like, uh, outside the properties. I can say it's right on the boundary. 
but I half. had a drainage pipe underneath that goes back to my yard again. Like yeah. I run the uh, drain pipe. Around you have an east trough that and east that drop. maybe east drop and going back to my uh, uh, my property. Yeah, know. and in in particular, from uh, the committee's perspective, perhaps inserting that condition that uh, all runoff is maintained on the private property may be something that we could agree to. Uh, but again, uh, we'll we'll deal with that when we're actually discuss the the vote as well. Any other comments? Okay, if not, seeking a motion to proceed. Just for, sorry, just for clarification prior to you going forward with the motion, yeah. I do want to confirm that the driveway width is permitted. So none of the hard surface of the driveway would need to be removed. What would have to happen, though, is that the curb would need to be reinstated to a point where the permitted parking space depth is met at 5.4 meters. And that, from my understanding, or I would assume that's where condition six fortifies that and, and really reiterates that, correct? Correct, except it is just the curb. It is just the curb. That's right. Okay. So not the pavers that are uh, not, not necessarily. They could not be used to park right. on. Right, right. Certainly in that area, the boulevard is very, very narrow between the sidewalk. Um, but they could be used and shoveled to place your garbage bins on, for example. So then, number six then, is it not somewhat misleading when it says the owner reinstates the curb and landscape soft surface boulevard within the, because if you're saying it's just the curb, that's confusing to me. I would assume it'd be confusing to the public and the applicant as well. Pardon me. Sorry, through you. Mr. Chair, you are correct. A portion of, certainly the grading of the property would have to be reestablished, and then that would include some soft surface landscape okay, so beneath there to match then the height of the curb that would have to be reinstated. Right, okay. So then that is accurate then. Okay. Ms. Dawson? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, given the fact that there seems to be a uh, concern with how and which curb this should have been cut, if the curb were reinstated, the paving would still be there and somebody could still park. So eliminating the curb, if one looks at the fact that there may or may not have been a mistaken identification of which curb, would seem to be a bit onerous to reinstate if the parking could still occur because it remains hardscaping. Correct. However, it would still only accommodate a two vehicle in word bound motion so they wouldn't have the additional width at the curb level to pull an, another vehicle straight in they would have to try and maneuver them around each other but the bylaw does permit on a 60 foot lot a 30 foot wide driveway okay. through you mr chair my apologies just for clarification but uh if if there's an intent to or a suggestion to put planters um so that a car can't per, uh, park perpendicularly this is tough in a perpendicular fashion, could the same be done then down the side of the driveway rather than reinstating a curb, which seems to be a little bit of work? No, because that's the municipal that's boulevard the municipal and, and uh, our okay. boulevard maintenance bylaw and our public works would not want to see that happen. Okay. Okay. Through you, Mr. Chair. So if 30 square meters of open space is required to preserve this tree, one, can you please confirm whether the tree is in the boulevard or not? And two, if all this paving can stay, where are they going to create the 30 square meters to protect the tree? Exactly. So is staff's understanding that the tree was in the city's right of way? Um, looking at it, it may not be, but I think these trees, which are the street trees, sometimes in subdivisions get planted on just on the private side due to other constraints that may be in the boulevard in front of a lot. So effectively, it is a street tree for this property, and it ought to be protected. Um, quite frankly, staff's recommendation is that around the tree, just to the south of it, there ought to be some landscaping, and then our open, our open space team will have to look at if the, the land, the so landscaping to the north would suffice for the remaining amount 
Um, they have advised us that it doesn't have to be contiguous so that there could be a hard surface pathway between, say, the tree and then the remaining landscaping, as long as the roots have somewhere to go in the future and some way to reach, um, uh, I guess, the rain and so forth. So um, it doesn't have to be right up against the tree and then contiguous the entire space around it. So, okay. um, and again, as I advised, we would be okay with taking the number out to allow flexibility. I, uh, I, um, I understand the philosophy and I think it's, it's the right thing. I just, I just think it's too onerous to be putting even um, any, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's almost innate that the planter is going to be staying. I mean, they may change or alter. If they change and alter, then it's not going to be uh, within the 30 feet that's allowable anyway. And at that point in time, there'll be a change. So from my perspective, uh, I think just so that we can uh, move on. I would actually put a motion forward to um, support the application, uh, but with amendments, I would like to see um, the gazebo supported as well. And then I would like to see, I think number five should just be eliminated in, in, in its entirety, and then all other staff recommendations, I think, are um, definitely acceptable, and obviously some alteration to seven because. I'm supporting the gazebo from my perspective. So I'll put that motion forward. Um, there may be some clarity that will be sought. Mr. Chair, uh, to the applicant, uh, that the contractor list to you provided by the city? Yes. So maybe now when you reinstate, uh, don't go through that list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or I mean, I know it's, it's onerous on you as well, but I would definitely seek... Um, have the conversation with the contractor. It's not fair that you're going to be potentially uh, flipping. So they're going to build the curb again. The city going to make it, or I have to. It make would be on your, on your. It's your responsibility from what okay. we are recommending at this point in time. So my question is, why the city have on his website if we have a 60 foot lot and we are able to cut the curb on three three feet each side? Why the city based my time? And my money and your time. Okay, so I'm, I'm not, let me just cut you off one second. I don't think it's necessary that the city, and I'll get some clarity on that, that three feet on both sides, I believe it would be, even from what I understand, three feet on one side. There was just an error uh, from your contractor that cut the wrong side that now makes that opening larger than it's allowed. No, but on the website, say, you can get the approval from three feet each side. If you have 60 feet long. So now we're... That's we're, why I apply for it. We're looking at, at semantics. Cut. I, we don't have the luxury of looking at the website. I would be willing to argue that it would be either side, and I'll get some clarity from staff on that end as well. I, I am certain it's both side on the website, clearly. I won't waste my money and my time. I understand. And, 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 I, and perhaps that's... If I, it doesn't run shows on that, right? To be clear, then, I'm going to just ask you one, ask staff sure. one question. The opening, what is the allowable opening? The allowable opening in this case is only for the portion of the driveway where a vehicle depth of 5.4 meters between the wall of the building and the front lot line can be maintained. Right. That's the permitted width of the opening. The permitted width of the paved surface is, la is, is, larger. is larger. The permitted width of the paved surface on a 60-foot lot is 30 feet, so 9.14 meters. That is what the website says. It also quite specifically says that you have to maintain 0.6 meters or two feet of permeable landscaping between the lot line and the hard surface of the pavement, whether it's a walkway or driveway, that two feet of permeable is a requirement in the bylaw. I don't know what website or I, web page. I, I, the application that's provided on the website does allow applicants to apply for a widening on both sides of the driveway. The widening that was approved with this application was a maximum width of 24 feet, which was the size of the opening, and then must maintain 0.6 meters on one side for the permeable landscaping. Yeah. I don't know that there would even be three feet on the one side to be able to be widened. It's possible that he's got four feet, but it's not three feet yeah. on both and, and, sides. And again, sir, I, I understand your frustration um, and not entirely defending the city, but in one way, yes. I would be more um, 
I think the contractor has, has dropped the ball in this, in this case because you may not be able to read the permit, but they should be able to read the permit. And that's where it's, uh, you did the right, you went through the right channels, uh, and unfortunately, so that's where I'm recommending that you should be having that comment, that discussion with the contractor, uh, and then staff may be able to give you some further insight into that. But that's, again, a discussion for, um, so I put that motion forward just so that we can move on and hopefully reach a, a, a mutual um, satisfaction <coughs> of sorts. So I'm putting the motion forward to um, deny um, Variance one, as staff has indicated, but approve um, variance three, three and two. Um, I do not see the need for uh, condition five from my perspective. Uh, and then obviously there will be some alteration to condition seven to read two and three. So do you, Mr. Chair, uh, do you understand this motion? Yes, sir. Do you understand those yes. before we proceed? And, and would you accept those conditions if they are imposed? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chair, I have difficulty supporting your motion. If we were providing for significant enough soft surface landscape area to protect that tree. I, I tend to agree, but I think the verbiage is it's not necessary because we're putting something there that is subjective. So we eliminated potentially staff can support eliminating 30, but then what is the, what is it going to be 10? Is it going to be 20? And we're, it's going to be a back and forth. Now, if committee can see that something is there, I can tend to agree. I don't have a, really a point. I just think it's not necessary, but I'll leave it to the committee to, um, you know, a committee's discretion as well. I'm no arborist, but from personal experience, there's not sp space for this tree to grow. And uh, I recently had an arborist at uh, my property, and he said, "Well, too many hard surfaces." To but to your choke. point, to your point earlier, if the hard surface can remain, now where's the 30, or where's the distance going to come, or where's the, the soft surface going to come from? But if we leave uh, five in, then some of that. For for um, for condition five, some of the hard surface is going to be removed. And what is some though? Now we're leaving it open ended. That's where I I think that we're leaving it too open ended for even the the applicant and the city. Where's the this can this can debate can go on for a while, Ms. Duffler? Sorry, Mr. Chair. Could I just ask the applicant how much space is around the tree trunk? I was not able to see anything because there was snow. But how much, to your best guess? I don't have exactly my amount. I think it's enough. I had a few this flowers. This much? This no, much? No, it's, it's a bit bigger than that. Like, I would say six feet. I, six feet and maybe eight feet around the tree. Six feet all around? Yeah. Let, let me just, I guess, then to Mr. 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 Crouch's point. To Mr. Crouch's point, and maybe a question to staff. If we maintain, is maintaining what is currently there something that would be so that there's no further encroachment? Would that be something that, so the verbiage in that would be maintaining what is currently present as per the sketch? And I know you can't answer that potentially because you're not arborists as well. As well. Um, I believe that what's currently present, uh, our open space staff are fear that that actually is impacting the health of that tree as what's there right now. Oh. I leave it to the committee. I, I think we can just go on forever on this point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think uh, based on uh, the site visit and uh, what I can see clearly in the picture, uh, if uh, I'm okay with whatever is there now around the tree, and uh, that is satisfactory to me. So I, I put forward the motion. Um, if someone would like to modify, and I'm open for modification, but it's just so we can deal with the ac application. Chair, for condition five, I would maintain it, and I would uh, drop the uh, 30 uh, for staff recommendation. I believe I heard. Uh, I, I did. I just and and I, I tend to agree. Don't don't sense. I'm not. It just tends to be more of what's that number? 
it's going to be a discussion back and forth that I think is difficult to actually accomplish. I mean, uh, the applicant didn't seek an actual, they're going to be having discussions with staff ongoing without having clarity on what that is. That's where I think that I want, I want to try and deter that. So, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, my, uh, I need some information from staff. If, so, if, so, if staff is in agreement with dropping that number 30, and it still be able to read a minimum surface <coughs> without any numbers, or it's just going to be read as is. So I tend to agree on and that, Mr. Mr. Chair's uh, proposal, because if there's no number, then I don't think so. This condition should be there. Um, through the chair, the suggestion is that the condition could read that a minimum uh, soft, that is, or just period, that a soft surface landscape area be reinstated around the tree, including the area towards the driveway, to the satisfaction of the manager of open space development. Um, that would mean that where the comment emanated from, that that individual assess the situation and decide what um, what the appropriate amount is. And, and, and to I your mean, point, understanding the situ, you know. Uh, yeah, I think we're we're beating this to death a, a little bit. But what I'm, I think some of those comments may have even arisen because, with the assumption that that driveway remains, and if something is driven on it, it affects the root system. I'm making assumptions as well. But if nothing's driving on that, then the root system isn't impacted underneath the ground either. But again, uh, I'm no expert on that field. So, <coughs> Ms. Dauphin? To me, Mr. Chair, given that none of us are uh, arborists, yep. might I suggest that we um, allow for maintaining the existing, and should the tree die, that it gets replaced? I mean, ultimately, if we don't know whether there is a problem or not, Nobody's driving on the roots. Uh, I myself have seen in cityscapes where you have a much smaller amount of space um, than what's been provided here. Maybe a different type of tree. These things I don't know. But if if we're looking, and if the applicant would be okay with it, um, it really would be up to you to decide that the tree is going to be maintained properly. Yes. And if it does cease to exist that you would have to replace it um, so the onus would be on you would would that make some sense since we can't seem to get consensus here so staff would not uh, through the chair staff would not make that recommendation or so i'm here based on you know the information we've received through mm -hmm. our review and mm -hmm. we've been advised that that tree will be impacted in this situation I know there's scenarios where we all see them in urban areas where they do survive, but we also know the likelihood is greater that it won't survive or that it will be impacted once you do pay on to them. So that's, I can't do any more than that. Anymore. I understand. Yeah. And I, I understand the difficulty, so I'm, I'm leaving it open-ended. I had put that motion forward. Well, just one uh, clarification, uh, Chair. How would you like to read uh, condition number seven? Well, condition seven would just be the uh, will approve uh, filler um, committee shall render the approval of variance two and three. If I'm putting forward the the recommendation of um, supporting variance three, then the one we are not supporting is variance one. motion that would get rid of all of paragraph five. Um, I believe that a minimum, the deletion of minimum 30 square meters is sufficient. Uh, with respect to the gazebo setback, I have some sympathy for your position. I also uh, didn't get close enough to determine whether the roof overhang the, overhung the lot line or not. But the staff's information is that it does not. The wall was the measurement. So the roof there must therefore go over municipal land. To your point, Mr. Chair, I could check the roof overhang is either on the, the fence line or a couple of inches behind it that I wasn't able to determine. And to I Ms. Know. Doffler's point as well, uh, from what I understand, when they say wall, that may be from the 
that bench that they're referring to as well. That's correct. And and from the photos that I have, I haven't personally visited the site, but the measurement was taken from the bench, the lower level, and the guard to the fence. The posts are inset then, and it does appear that the roof does not overhang the fence line. It would sort of drain over. It doesn't, not sure if it's got an eaves trough on that side. There is some eaves trough on, on the top as well, but it definitely does not overhang the city's property. Okay. So I have put that motion forward. Again, if, if, um, if, sta- if committee cannot support uh, in its entirety, if there are revisions, that's fine. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Ms. Dolfer is just showing me uh, photographs of the uh, setback. Sorry. Ms. Corazon, I'm sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair, through you, and I'm, I'm somewhat confused right now, so please bear with me. Um, the motion that you're putting forward is simply to approve variances two and three. Correct. Were you also recommending the removal of the sentence of condition five with respect to the landscaping? I, I was, because I, 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 I think okay. it is subjective. Now, again, okay. I leave it to the committee if that's something that they cannot support. Okay. I, I understand the philosophy. I just think it's too vague. I understand. I just wanted to comment if you, if your, if this motion fails, and should the committee choose to keep condition five, I do have some recommended changes to the word. Perhaps we can hear the recommended changes. Certainly, um, in reading it, the second sentence in that condition suggests that the perimeter of the landscaping shall de- be delineated with a barrier that prohibits vehicular ap- vehicle access. To me, that means a raised border around that planter. That would not be permitted in the boulevard. So I would ask that you strike that sentence. It would be an encroachment on the city's lands. The city does not want to see raised planters on the boulevard. Right. So it's getting smaller and smaller. The, the landscaping can be there. Yeah. It just can't be an element that's raised above to cause a trip hazard on city property. Okay. I'm maintaining that it's eliminated in its entirety. But Understand. Again. Uh, I do understand uh, uh, and I respect uh, Mr. Crouch's point and uh, uh, at the same time uh, uh, we have visited the property and homeowner is doing everything for the betterment. I don't think so any homeowner would like to see the trees dying in front of their home and uh, it's a little bit complicated uh, but I am supporting uh, Mr. Uh, Chair's motion. I'm I'm seconding your motion okay. as presented. So that's uh, we have the motion in front of us. All in favor? Okay, just, sorry, Mr. Chair, could you just repeat it again? Just so that we're okay. It's 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 um it's as staff's co- uh, comments. The only change would be that variance three is supported as well. Um, the extent of variance to be limited to shown as the, uh, on the sketch. Four would remain. Five would be stricken. Six would remain, and obviously seven would just be altered to include two and three. That makes sense from a staff's perspective as well. Yes, I might add that the that condition three is amended then to add that the extent of variance is two and, and three. three. Correct. Okay. So we have a seconder. I'll just put the question forward. All in favor? That carries. So, sir, um, those conditions that you agreed to as well, there are certain modifications, the curb in particular, at the base. Uh, and then you could get some more clarity from staff's perspective as well uh, on what has to be removed at that base of the boulevard as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I just make a comment. I just appreciate that the homeowner has gone through the official process, they've looked at the website, they've applied for a permit. So we have created and it has taken us all this time amongst all of these experts and without certain experts here to understand what you should be allowed to do. And my apologies for this process. Thank you, Lori. Thanks for your time and stop there. Thank you. Calling application A18013, Putin Holdings Limited. Property is located at 100 Railroad Street.
Morning, Mr. Chairman. Morning, uh, committee and the staff. Uh, my name is Kusai Safar, and the address is 40 Holtby Avenue. And I'm here on behalf of my company with regard to our minor variance application to use uh, the lot at 100 Railroad as a parking for a uh, trailer. So this is the main uh, variance on, on this application. And later on, we added some related variance to that related to the setback of the site office, which is a construction trailer. Currently, we have um, only 1.2 meter from only one corner uh, instead of four. And the other variance is to permit uh, uh, the fencing, which is currently uh, located exactly at the uh, Main Street, uh, rail, rail road, sorry. And the fourth minor variance is to have uh, 0.6 meter only at the side of the main entrance instead of six. So uh, these are the variants. And the reason why we need to use that lot as a parking for the trailer, uh, the main uh, office in 40 Holtby uh, rented all the buildings in that area for companies uh, doing some uh, uh, production and unfortunately at 40 Holtby Avenue there is no enough spacing uh, spaces for the trailer. So the same company own all the lots on uh, railroad starting from 9 to 4 till 100 all this belong the same company and they thought if we can uh, temporarily convert one of these lots uh, as a parking for the trailer. So the driver can come at the night, park the trailer there, then move in the morning. So um, uh, unfortunately that uh, maybe is not the case as per the bylaw maybe. So um, we're trying to, to find a way if we can still keep using that uh, lot. Thank you, sir. We'll ask some questions of staff as well. Are there any questions um, to the owner as well? Yeah. O owner or agent? Owner? Uh, yeah, the okay. agent of the owner. Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience here to speak on this application? Ma'am? Sir? <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. I am here uh, not in support of this application. I live on the southeast corner at 76 McMurchy. That's my house. And... Um, these tractor trailers are going up and down McMurchie 24 hours a day. There are 50-foot trailers on the back of these uh, vehicles. It's noisy. It's a very densely um, pedestrian neighborhood. There's loads of people around, people walking dogs. There's uh, the intersection, which is just north of me, is Railwood and McMurchie. It's just a one-way stop. So when people are trying to cross the road, cars don't stop. So why introduce these heavy vehicles into the neighborhood, which doesn't fit with the character of the neighborhood? or with the population. So I think it's a bad idea. I think it's just a matter of time before there's a serious accident. The roads aren't set up for this type of traffic as well. So, you know, there is going to be wear and tear on the roads. And I'm not sure that the neighborhood is prepared for that, or even if the city is prepared to incur the cost to repair roads due to these heavy vehicles. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, if the speaker could identify herself for the record, please. I apologize. My name is Jillian Olahan, and my address is 76 McMurchy North. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, sir? <coughs> Mr. Chair, um, committee, staff, um, I'm here today. My name is Arnold Wiley, and I'm here today to support is the address too, sir? 106 Railroad Street, adjacent to the commercial property, or pardon me, the industrial property, that uh, essentially uh, the clients here is, are my neighbors, and we operate a business from that location. We have truck traffic. Um, my family has owned that property since the 50s. Um, certainly I know that the neighborhood has changed. I can understand the concern. However, the properties have been deemed industrial for a number of years and people moving into that neighborhood 
uh, have the understanding or should have the understanding and the realization that as commercial properties and or industrial properties in the area, they need access and need to run a business from those properties. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate both the comments. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience here to speak on this application? Seeing none, staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, staff have reviewed the application, and it is our finding that the application does not meet the four tests in the Planning Act. Specifically, I would note the property is zoned M1 industrial. That industrial zone does not permit outside storage, and the intent is that industrial activity is to take place within the build within buildings, um, allowing outside storage as the primary use on the site uh, does not conform to the intent of that zone. I would also note um, there are a significant number of residential, including low, medium, and high density residential uses in the area. In the secondary plan, these properties are also designated, this area is also designated for medium, high, slash, high density land, residential land uses. Um, the proposed outside storage would negatively affect those uses through impacts um, both visual from buildings themselves and from the streetscape noise and traffic and they would also present conflicts with the planned land uses for the area so for those reasons staff is not in support of the application any questions by committee members to staff Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. how long has uh, this business been operating at this um, location it's since uh, December last year and may I ask what was there previous uh, just a vacant uh, lot there is nothing there yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none? Yeah, uh, from my perspective, I, I have to support staff in, in their analysis. I guess understanding the difficulties with that area, it's, it's a very uh, transition type old manufacturing with residential. Um, there's just not enough support in terms of even studies, traffic studies, things along those studies that along those. Um, that rationale that would be able to at least justify something and that perhaps then coming back and working with staff for something down the road more transitional I don't know but at this point in time it's just very difficult to support as it as it stands so I'll leave it at that um, if there are no further comments seeking a motion to proceed okay motion to support staff recommendations seconded by Ms. Doffler all in favor that carries that did not pass sir. okay you do have the, the right to appeal to the 20-day appeal period as well calling application a 18015 Paul and Camilla Dan Paul the property is located at 38 Bullerton Close. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kamala Dan Paul at 38 Bullerton Close. And it's for a of, uh, Can I just ask you to speak up? Sorry, ma'am. <laughs> That's okay. Just take your time. It's not a big deal. Okay. Um, I'm here for a minor variance uh, for, uh, I think, for 0.2 two meters, and I have 1.18 meters. So it's like, I think, three quarter of an inch difference. So I'm here that I would like it to stay as is, side entrance. Thank you. Any any questions by committee members? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience here to speak on this application? Ma'am? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Hodgkin. Um, I live at 40 Willerton Close, standing on the porch. It's to the immediate right. Uh, we purchased 40 Willerton Close five and a half years ago, 
and we have spent a lot of time and money repairing and replacing fencing and property because of the rental unit at 38 Willerton Close. It's a constant flow of criminals and I'm sorry hoodlums that are, are renting the unit and um, we do not want any further construction and I don't know what I have to do to even get the rental unit closed um, but we don't want any more disruption to our community. Um, aside from that house and another house that is cleared out, it's a really nice community and we just don't want any further disruptions in our community. And, and I appreciate your comments. I guess the difficulty lies is we're dealing with land use issues. Uh, in terms of tenancy, I know, and I, I understand and I, I empathize. So yeah, where the back door is um, for her basement unit, uh, we spent almost uh, $3,500 repairing and replacing because her tenants were putting their garbage and everything else against the fence and it was like falling right over when we first moved in. There is not much space between our property line fence and her back door um, and it, it's just any leaving it there like the, the tenants they're smoking outside it goes into our house and it's just, I don't know if moving it to the front of the house would make the situation any better. Okay. But like the property, there's a lot of damage already sustained because of the, the garbage and, and everything that's there. Thank you. We'll get some, some comments from staff as well. Um, because what uh, is clear here is even with staff's recommendations, uh, this is not to be used for an unregistered secondary unit. So that's something that is a must from their recommendations. So we'll go over those details as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience here to speak on this application? Yes. Sir? I'm the neighbor to the opposite side, uh, 36 Willerton. And uh, what my neighbor here just said, I, it's pretty much on the ball exactly what I would have said. We have been suffering from all this drug paraphernalia being thrown on our property. I've fixed the fence two years ago, putting new posts, everything. And because of the misuse by the tenants, the fence is now falling down. I cannot get the owners to budge to pay for it. I thought about doing it and getting the city to act on collecting, but I figure that's uh, maybe a waste of time. The neighbor issues becomes very difficult, so understood. Yes, it, it's well, I'm, I'm just saying, uh, I didn't fully understand what was going on until I found out that uh, the police, well, I know the police are in the area all the time, and uh, it, it just creates problems. I understand. And, and again, not to harp on this, again, some of those details are beyond the scope of this committee. The committee deals with the land use issues, but I do understand and you're open to, to convey your comments as well. And if I might add one more thing. Yes, sir. Um, the occurrence of Lyme disease is getting very prevalent in southern Ontario. I know the neighbor behind that lot had to call a city because the trees in the lot was like that high and the neighbors used the front as a playground. So it's up to the ownership to <coughs> see that the uh, tenants try to maintain that mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, and those are land standard and property standard issues that you're open to always call the city for those issues as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Through you, Mr. Chair, the, the speaker has not provided his name. He Again, has sorry, given I his apologize. address. Sir, just your, your name and address for the record. Uh, Patrick Kelly, 36, Willow Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Myers. Okay. Uh, anyone else in the audience here to speak on this application? Seeing none, staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? <clears throat> staff are in support of this application uh, for the reduction of the interior side yard from 
uh, 1.18 uh, from the required 1.2, uh, subject to the following conditions. One, that the extent of the variances be limited to that shown on the sketch attached to the public notice. Two, that drainage on adjacent properties shall not be adversely affected. Three, that the side entrance shall not be used to access an unregistered second unit. And fourth, that failure to comply with and maintain the conditions of the committee shall render the approval null and void. Thank you. So ma'am, do you understand the conditions uh, as they are stated? Okay, so firstly, uh, I guess I'll ask it as a question. Is the basement currently being rented? Yes. Okay, so staff is in support of the application, but in their conditions, they highlight the fact that it is not to be used for an unregistered second unit. Therefore, the only way that these conditions are valid is if that basement apartment is registered and complies with all city bylaws and, and fire codes and so forth. So... Yeah. That's what I'm here for because I'm applying to do that. Okay, I'm so that being said, yes. that's why I'm posing the question that staff has put their recommendations. Committee now has to decide on which direction to go to, but I want to make it clear that these conditions are being posed uh, and you understand and agree to those conditions. Yes, I do. Okay. So that being said. And Mr. Chair, just for clarification, do you understand that that means that any unregistered basement apartment is now illegal and should be vacated? This is not a committee to approve or register a second dwelling unit in this house. There's an entire new process that needs to be applied for. Yes. I did apply and I have to go through the second, so I was, um, they said they cannot uh, process it because it's not until it is until is this one here yes okay. so i'm on the process of the okay so miss corzola i can confirm that an application to register the second unit was submitted and approved is zoning certified yeah. with the principal entrance being shown on the drawings through the front of the house um, this variance is required in order for a building permit now to be obtained for the change of use that will require upgrades to the building it will also um, require a permit for the construction of that door um, in the side yard, which is why the variance is required. Okay. Ma'am, would you like to make a comment? I'm, I'm sorry. I've, I've been there almost six years, and Patrick and his wife have been there much longer than me, and that unit is rented as a basement apartment and, for and, many, and many years. The, the owner has acknowledged that, yeah. but from this committee's perspective, we are dealing with the plan use issues. Mr. Crouch and both myself and staff have these approvals do not allow a basement apartment. Be clear on that. They do not allow a basement apartment. What we are essentially, um, staff has put their recommendations that an unregistered basement apartment, that door is not allowed for an unregistered use, to be clear. They are in the process of registering, again, beyond the scope of this committee. Uh, there is a process to do so. And if they meet the criteria and pass those, then it would be a registered use, and then these conditions are fulfilled. That being said, they have to abide with all the rules and regulations that a secondary unit um, comes with, if you will. And as neighbors, would we be notified of that? Would we have any say in the applet, like in the application approval? Or I, I'll, I'll refer it to staff. I believe that there is a system already in place, but yeah, the, through you, Mr. Chair, the ability to register a second unit is an as of right permission in any single semi or townhouse dwelling that meets the qualifying factors for provision of a second unit, including additional parking spaces, um, path of travel to the access, um, and certain building code requirements. Obviously, an upgrade to the unit inside will have to meet the building code requirements for a multi-unit building. Um, but aside from that, there is no public notification. There will be a notification and a posting on the window of the building permit when it issues, um, and any construction obviously has to be inspected by building staff. Um, once the property has finally been registered, it will be listed on the city's website of all registered units throughout the city, of which right now we have about 3,000. And, and is people from the community 
Do we have any say in that unit being approved or not approved as a rental? Not at all. Yeah. Not if it meets the requirements. Meet. And this is unfortunately not just city. These are provincial legislations where, and, and again, these property and neighbor issues become very difficult for us. However, the process is more onerous and it, there's steps that need to be followed. And it just becomes theoretically easier for Clary that is a registered and meets safety issues and so forth. That's that's really what this committee is here for. Okay. Okay. Sir. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joe Castellano. I used to own 64 Willerton Close seven years ago, and I think what you're not understanding is just the just address the committee, sir. Oh, okay. Okay. So the way it works. I think what she's trying to figure out is in order to apply for a basement, there are certain things that need to be done. What they're asking is if she applies for this permit, it has nothing to do with them in the sense that they can just apply for it and it's good. But in actual fact, there has to be separate entrances, windows have to be a certain size. There's a lot of construction that needs to be done in order for this to... Yeah, and, and, I, and I appreciate your comments. And that's something that you can inquire from the city on the processes. Again, to be clear, this committee is on land use and that I just want to reiterate that. But its attempt is to be able to put in certain parameters that help that process and assure that it's done properly at, at the very least on safety issues. Okay. So again, ma'am, you understand and agree to all these conditions. Yes, I do. That's just for clarity. So if there are no further comments. Um, Mr. Crouch? Through you, Mr. Chair, I, I wouldn't be fair, prepared to, to uh, support something on the basis of this land use question. Uh, the uh, application to register the second unit has nothing to do with this committee. The minor variance being requested is the encroachment of a stairwell six inches into a side yard, and that's it. That is it. True. Okay. And that's just to reiterate what is being sought at this point. It is a one variance that's being sought from this committee. Okay, seeking a motion to proceed. Motion to approve uh, staff's recommendation. Motion to approve as per staff's recommendations by Mr. Chetta. Do we have a second there? I'll second that motion. All in favor? That carries. That is approved, ma'am. And again, understanding those conditions need to be fulfilled and met. Okay. Thank you. And I would like to have a copy. Of Everything will be submitted uh, in writing. There is a 20-day appeal period that, again, anyone uh, can appeal if they so wish by going through the process uh, of uh, getting the information from the Secretary Treasurer of the Committee as well. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Calling application A18016, Larry and Marilyn Castro. The property is located at 224 Sussex Vale Drive. <clears throat> Mr. Morning. Chairman, committee members, staff, uh, I don't really have too much to say. I've read the staff report and I'm in total complete agreement with it, um, including all the recommendations that are there. It, it is truly a minor variance. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any questions or comments to the... Sorry, did you state your name? My, oh, my name is Louis Battiston, and uh, I'm acting on behalf of the Castros. Okay. Any questions by committee members to the agent? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience here to speak on this application? Seeing none, we do have, um, one, two, I believe, three letters. Um, one in opposition, two in opposition, and all three in opposition. So those have been submitted. I, I haven't seen those. Okay, I'll. Do we have a copy, Ms. Myers? They were submitted yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
So they have been submitted for the record as well. Again, no one in the audience here on this application, correct? Staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? Staff are in support of this application uh, with the subject conditions. Uh, <laughs> one, that the extent of variances be limited to that shown on the sketch attached to the public notice. Two, that the side yard to the addition be limited to that shown on the sketch attached to the public notice. Three, that the height of the peak of the structure be limited to 4.34 meters and a slight change to uh, what was in your um, uh, report. It's actually 14 feet 3 inches. And then to remove as shown on the sketch attached to the public notice because of the height isn't actually shown on the public notice. So to strike that from uh, the recommendation. Four, that drainage on adjacent property shall not be adversely affected. Five, that the elevations be satisfactory to the Commissioner of Planning and Development Services prior to a building permit being issued. Six, that a building permit be obtained prior to construction of the proposed sunroom. And seven, that failure to comply with and maintain the conditions of the committee shall render the approval null and void. Thank you. So for clarity, there are six conditions. One has been removed, correct? Uh, in, sorry, uh, through the chair. Uh, it's just to change uh, the uh, the conversion of, uh, it says 11, three, uh, 11 feet uh, 6 inches, which should actually be 14 feet 3 inches. And just the, the, uh, and the, the sketch portion to be removed. That's correct. Okay. okay, so sir, have you not, have a, have you had an opportunity to review those conditions? To review? The conditions as stated yeah, in absolutely. the recommendations and yes. agreed to yeah. those conditions? I have no problem. Whatsoever. Okay. Any other questions by committee members? Ms. Dauphin? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, unfortunately, due to weather, I couldn't go back. Um, this seems like a significant uh, difference in terms of what is required and what is being uh, allowed. Is there an impact on the neighbors? Uh, will this be significantly forward of their rear yard, or do they have decks? Um, it, I was able to actually get into the backyard, and we must have been at different times. Um, it, it, in viewing from it, uh, I, I viewed this from sort of, uh, if you were to be on the second story in one of the rooms in the rear yard, uh, sorry, in one of the rooms on the top floor, you would have a similar or actually a, a, a more of a view of your neighbor's yard than if you were in the proposed sunroom. Um, and also to the proposed sunroom, uh, uh, I can't speak to this directly, but perhaps zoning can. Uh, if that were uh, the, the um, implications, if it was just a deck, um, uh, if Sony could uh, answer the question, if that was, uh, if it wasn't a sunroom, if it was a deck, if it would uh, uh, be allowable as per the zoning bylaw. Through you, Mr. Chair, in response to my colleague's questions, a deck is a permitted encroachment into the required rear yard, whereas an enclosed sunroom is a building addition which is not permitted to encroach into the required rear yard. Um, so yes, while they would ultimately have similar setback, there are obviously walls involved in the sunroom. Um, I do note that a, an accessory structure would be permitted in the rear yard, obviously in compliance with the setbacks. This structure is set back further than an accessory structure would be in the rear yard, and it's not a whole lot bigger, um, I don't think, than a, a permitted accessory structure at 15 square meters would be. Um, so there are some comparisons there. Uh, height, obviously, of an accessory building is limited to 3 meters or 10 feet approximately, but that's measured at the midpoint of the peak of the roof. This is actually an 11 meter, sorry, 4.34 at the peak, which is not inconsistent either with an accessory building. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, seeking a motion to proceed. Okay. Motion to approve by Mr. Nurse. Seconded. Seconded by Mr. Crouch. All in favor? That carries. That is approved, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Calling application A18017, Gold Bright Trading Company Limited, 
The property is located at 30 Rambler Drive. Good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members and city staff. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wong, uh, the representative for uh, the, the client, the owner. Uh, the property we're talking about here is 30 Rambler Drive and it's to permit a private school uh, at Unit 10 of a property. Uh, we did a, an application, effectively this application is to, is to uh, correct the GFA that we reported last time, last, uh, last September. Uh, last time in September we reported uh, a GFA of 1,100 square feet. Uh, when we went through with a building permit application, uh, it was, uh, we realized that uh, we, made a, we made a mistake. Uh, so effectively here, we're here to report of a correct GFA of 1350 square feet. Thank you. Yes, this was before us and we did approve it with that previous 1100, correct? Any other questions by committee members to the agent? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience here to speak on this application? Seeing none, staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? Through the chair, staff is in support of the um, application subject to the following conditions being imposed. One, that the private school use be approved for a temporary period of three years from the date of the decision of the committee. Two, that the private school use be limited to a GFA of 125.4 square meters, which is the up to amount to 1,350 square feet. Number three, that a maximum enrollment of 20 students be permitted at any given time. Four, that the applicant obtain a change of use permit for the private school prior to occupying the unit. Five, that the previous approval, approved variance um, A17-157 de be declared null and void. And number six, that failure to comply with and maintain the conditions of the committee will render the approval null and void. Thank you, sir. Sir, do you understand the conditions that are being recommended? Yes, I do. Can you agree to them? Yes, I do. Okay. Are there any questions by committee members? Seeing none, seeking a motion to proceed. Uh, motion to approve as part of the staff report. Motion to approve as per staff's recommendations by Mr. Crouch. Seconded by Mr. Chadda. All in favor? That carries. That is approved, sir. I do have one last request, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, because this application is effectively to just rectify uh, the GFA, is there any opportunity to get a refund on uh, this application? Um, that would be been something refund. that you would have put forward beforehand. Um, at this point in time, I do not believe there is a process for that. I could get some clarity. Ms. Myers? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, the, the applicant is within his right to make that request. To, At this point in time as well? Well, we have dealt with the application and we've made a decision. Okay. He is now coming forward requesting a refund or partial refund, whatever the case may be. So that is something that the committee can deliberate on. Okay. Uh, I'll ask you as a question the rationale be. Uh, I do know that uh, last time, the last application uh, of September of 2017, uh, there was a fair amount of work that was done between uh, myself and uh, city staff. Uh, and this time around, it is, uh, I believe, fair that uh, uh, I do understand that there is a fair amount of work that has been done, that has to be done in this very application. But I do understand, I do have to, uh, uh, we do have to also agree that it's only a minor rectification of, the, of one data. And so I just want to understand uh, where we can come into an agreement, into a partial reform. Okay. Um, obviously, it's within your right to ask the question. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll put my comments and then a committee can then uh, put their comments as well. Um, the fact, and, and then I guess, where did this 1,100 square feet come from? Was it a oversight from your part or from staff's part? It was an oversight from my part. Uh, right in the beginning, it was, uh, we knew all along of the 1350 uh, square feet. Uh, through papers going back and forth, we just, I just missed in, uh, in pr properly reporting the correct area. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's where, I guess, mm -hmm. the whole process still did have that's to go right. through the, the, um, I do understand the, the, um, the mail outs, the, the committee, the so forth. So it's hard for me to, to, um, 
even though I empathize with you and understanding, it, I mean, there is a cost to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been rectified if there was more some, some more due diligence at, at the beginning. So that's from my perspective as well. Okay. okay. So if there's any other comments by committee members, then seeking a motion for the request uh, of refund, partially or fully. Okay, so we have a motion not in support of any refund. Seconded. Seconded by Mr. Crouch. All in favor? That carries. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, but again, sir, respectfully. No, thank you. Thank you for doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. Thank you for giving me a chance to be fair. Thank you. Thank you. Calling application A18021, Eugene Calcia and Nora Veniva. The property is located at 89 Huntingwood Crescent. Is the owner or agent present for A18021, 89 Huntingwood Crescent? Seeing no one present. Ms. Myers, would we like to put that at the end of the agenda? Okay, as per normal practice, we'll just put that at the end of the agenda and recall. Calling application A18023, Joseph Castellana. Leno, property is located at 68 Wellington Street East. Good morning. Good morning Joseph sir. Castellano, 68 Wellington Street East. Any comments on the uh, application, sir? Yeah, but I don't get any of this that happened, but I'm going to let you guys do your thing. I, uh, I have, uh, and what I did was I bought a property that I invested a lot of money into, tried to clean this area up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm surrounded by neighbors who parked their cars in their backyard. So to me, what I did was I applied for a building. I built the building smaller than I was allotted. Uh, I then had a concrete pad built with the building. I built a shed as per the specs for when I called the city. And in between my garage and my shed was a five inch gap. I own a construction company. I operate, not my construction company, but I leave my tools and miscellaneous materials in that garage. So to have to put a door in the back and not be able to have access to the garage and the shed for five, six inches, mm -hmm. I didn't okay. want. Anyone. And we'll, we'll get some comments from staff and perhaps it's just, as you said, it's just something that didn't meet the, the rules and the parameters and had unfortunately had to go through this process. Yep. Perhaps at the time of permit could have been rectified, but we'll get some clarity on that as well. Right. Okay. Any questions to the owner? Correct? Owner. owner? Yes. Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience here to speak on this application? Seeing none, staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this application was reviewed against the uh, four tests under the Planning Act. Uh, the application was found to satisfy the four tests and uh, therefore find it supportable subject to the following conditions. Uh, that no commercial or industrial uses shall operate for the detached garage or the addition. That no other accessory structure shall be permitted on the property. That the owner shall obtain a building permit for the construction of the addition to the garage within 30 days of the final date of the committee's decision. That the maximum area of the addition to be detached, sorry, that the maximum area of the addition to the detached garage be restricted to 11.62 square meters. That the maximum height of the addition to the detached garage be restricted to three meters. Uh, that failure to comply with and maintain the conditions of the committee shall render the approval null and void. So, uh, Mr. Caruso, so just so some clarity, this arose because of the shed being attached to the garage? That is, that is correct, Mr. Chair. And just so the applicant can understand, I guess, is it because the original permit only showed the 
garage and not the shed, or was it they separate at that time? Or so, so, so the a permit for the garage itself, um, which is about I think forty eight square meters, uh, was issued on November fourth, two thousand sixteen. So the garage itself was there, there was a permit issued, but then by adding an addition to it, um, it increases uh, the floor area and it required uh, a building permit yeah. for that addition. And, and, and again, just that's, I guess for clarity, is the second they became attached, it became part of the garage. And that's what they're saying. And, and that's where, even in terms of public notices, things along those lines, it did not meet the parameters of what your permit was issued. And again, probably, I'm seeking staff's that, that's correct. The permit was issued for the original garage structure. No permit was obtained for the other one, but attaching it, attaching two buildings together essentially creates one larger building. Okay. And yeah, so the staff is recommended uh, to support. And again, um, I do applaud you going through the proper channels. Uh, and unfortunately, these are sometimes oversights that uh, do occur. And it is a learning process for everyone as well. Okay. Uh, so staff has recommended. Uh, approval with those conditions, sir. Do you understand and agree to those uh, conditions? No, because I, I actually applied for a permit uh, for this addition. I had multiple people from the city come see this property. I had the first gentleman from bylaw that came to see the property told me that, uh, in his words exactly, oh, this isn't what we're looking for. We're looking for people who are turning the garage into rental properties, which is clearly not what I was doing. I have cameras in my garage. I have a lot of material and tools in the garage. So to my defense, it was, I get I'm attaching a building to a building, but I'm surrounded by an area where for 20 years, people have been attaching buildings to buildings. And nobody seems to care. Okay. So, but just, just for clarity though, they are recommending an approval. But as per certain heights, I don't know what, uh, like three meters. The certain heights are from what is, and again, maybe we'll get some clarity on that. So through you, Mr. Chair, what we what are, we try to do through these recommendations is, you know, an accessory structure is permitted on the property, and we tried to make it consistent with an accessory structure. So we wanted to limit the height. Height, otherwise, uh, there's more of an impact on the neighboring properties uh, if it goes up to the 4.5 meters that's permitted by a garage. So we're limiting the height to three meters. To three meters. Yeah. So I guess a question Sorry. to you would be, because I was I did visit the site. That would, from my perspective, are you? It's a flat roof currently, correct? It's a flat roof. Are but you I was told by the city that if I wanted to, since I'm going through this procedure, I'm actually entitled to build the garage back. So to tell me now that I have to stick to this height and that's it. That's not what I was told last two weeks ago. Okay, so we'll get staff to, to respond. But from my perspective, these are recommendations. The other would perhaps require another permit, correct? Through you, Mr. Chair. The, the applicant at this uh, point is not, uh, does not comply with his owning bylaw. So this is why he's here. Um, with respect to the height, we wanted to limit the height of the, as I said earlier, to lessen the impact on neighboring properties. So that's the reason for the condition. And like I said, he is technically permitted an accessory structure. So if he was to remove this and not uh, add it to the garage as a, as a separate structure, uh, provided he meets the setbacks and limits the height to three meters, he would be permitted that accessory structure. Thank you, Chair. If I may clarify the the conditions merely merely reflect what the application that was before us and just try to scope it to this is what's been before us so we wish to restrict it to that and because we that's the known in our situation so that um, that's what we've been able to review in this in this situation not generate any sort of unforeseen impacts out of this whole okay. process so. so and then again from my perspective appreciating where you're coming from sir is that we need to have certain parameters there because if those parameters aren't there, then that you can theoretically then build another story on that on that uh, that shed or whatever you want to refer to it as. So staff has put forward their recommendations. If there was something that you thought was more that we can suggest and bring that forward, but again, we need to have certain parameters there so we're able to work within those parameters. So what sits right now is is okay. Some? Through through you, Mr. Chair, uh, what we're uh, recommending approval for is for that addition uh, to remain 
provided that it's no more than three meters in height. So I guess the question to you is that is that addition that shed higher than three meters in height? No. So therefore, you would fit fit those parameters. Yeah, but four people came to the house to measure. Don't they know what size of height it is? I don't. I believe, and I will ask them uh, as well. The reason why that recommendation is there is that, and I'm making the assumption is that it falls. What's there is below those parameters. Yes. So, Mr. Caruso. The reason that condition is there is to ensure that the height of the the attached uh, the, uh, the, <coughs> the attached structure does not is not the same height as the garage, which is which is higher. Uh, the the yeah. garage is uh, is allowed to be higher than an accessory structure. So I want to be I want the building or the uh, addition to be consistent with an access as consistent with an accessory structure as possible. So that's where I'm at. With this one. So again, not to be tied down on details, as long as you're comfortable with what is there right now, and you're comfortable that is below, it's below three meters, ten feet, then these recommendations are staff can support it. Um, we can't. Through you, Mr. Chair, in the application, the height is indicated seven point five feet. Okay. You also mentioned that. Another building cannot be built on this property. Someone told me that I'm now that I have attached my shed, it's no longer a shed, it's in a garage. I could also build a shed on my property. I'm entitled to a nine and, and these are the gray areas, and that's why staff is being clear in their recommendations. And again, not to put words in, into staff's mouth, that is a shed that essentially has been attached to your garage. There's no need for another shed or it would then fall into different parameters. So, again, um, any clarity on that, Mr. Crusoe? Uh, you, you've, said, you've said it, Mr. Chair. So okay. That's okay, so then no, so no other building. That would be my shed and my garage. So these conditions okay. are what you are agreeing to. That's, that's for clarity. So then if that's my shed and my garage, why did I have to pay $550 to now be, make my shed into a garage when my existing... Because you, well, you weren't meeting the bylaws. I mean, the, the bylaws were not being met. So at the time of when you were building the garage, yeah. if at that time it was added onto that, then the debate could have been at that time. And, and it again, could have been I didn't realize until I actually built the shed, that's when I realized how close. I understand, but with all due respect, neither did staff. No one realized at that point in time. They, we can't make assumptions on what's going okay, to happen. No, fair enough. But then, so if that shed is now, because I was told at the city, don't call it a shed. It's not a shed. It's an attachment to the garage. So it's a garage. So now I'm not allowed to have a shed. So why am I paying to attach my garage to the shed? If For I'm this whole process that we have under, undergone. You've had staff working on this. You've had a committee working on it. I've been working on it. I've been, I've been to the city five times. I've had four people to my house who told me four different stories. Unfortunately, different stories. that's the process, sir. And, and I, okay. you know, if things can be streamlined, um, there are scenarios that this comes in for us, and it's not a positive report, and people are feeling the same frustration. In this case, it is a positive report. And from my perspective, I just need to get the clarity on if you agree to those conditions or not. If I don't agree to those conditions, what's the next step from here? If you don't agree to those conditions, then committee has to make the recommendation or has to decide on what is um, what we are going to approve. If we do not approve it, right now at this point in time, there is no decision. Is that staff has put forward their recommendations. If for whatever reason you wanted to alter a measurement, this is your opportunity to do so, and then it would be in before the committee to um, to review. But we can't make decisions on hypotheticals, so we need to know what's before us. That's why uh, I ask if these are something that you can agree to. And through you, Mr. Chair, for clarity, um, if there is an approval subject to these conditions, you are agreeing to no accessory structure. Meaning I can't build a shed if I want That's to. right. That's, these there are the are conditions. No accessory because structures permitted on this property is condition two. Condition six basically highlights the fact that failure to maintain and comply. So if something in the future would have changed, then these conditions are null and void. Does this approval is null and void. Addition? Sorry? Does that include an addition to the, the home or just the garage? To the property. To, to the, the property. property. Oh, well, then uh, I... Just for clarification, I mean, if the applicant wanted to put an addition onto his house, you're open to he can put an addition submit, onto yeah. the house. Uh, if 
you're open to putting a application. There's no guarantees that will it be approved or not, but those are those are building code issues. These are not those are not committee levels. As long as you meet the the bylaws that are in place at that point in time, if bylaws at that point in time are infringed, then you would have to come back to this committee theoretically if you want to have an approval. Right. If, if I may just offer some context for clarity of the committee and for the applicant. The reason that this is a variance for an oversized accessory garage is because your shed was attached to the garage, making it a larger building than the bylaw would otherwise permit for a garage. Generally speaking, the zoning bylaw permits a garage of a limited size and, a and two additional accessory structures also of a limited size, 10 by 10 for each. In this case, because the committee is being asked to consider an overly large detached garage, planning staff are recommending that no additional accessory structures be permitted on the property so as not to overpopulate this property with accessory detached buildings. In terms of putting an addition on the house, that is an addition to a residential dwelling, which is evaluated completely separately from either a detached garage or an accessory problem. structure. So those, but it would have to physically be attached and connected to the interior. It can't be a shed leaning up to and supported with flashing on top of the, the wall of the building. Um, so would that would be an accessory structure yeah. which would not be permitted. Um, but an addition of habitable space into a residential dwelling may or may not be permitted if it complies with the bylaw and the building code. Does that shed some light on that, sir? Yeah. Okay. So again, I just have to get an answer on if these recommendations, do you agree to the conditions as they are before us? Yes. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Crouch? Uh, motion to approve uh, with the conditions as written. Motion to approve with conditions as written. Seconded by Mr. Nurse. All in favor? That carries, that is approved, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Calling application A18024, Thomas and Naomi Kennedy. The property is located at 94 Woodward Avenue. Good morning. Good morning, sir. I'm also Thomas Kennedy, the owner's father, and um, there's an existing garage on the property that will be converted to an accessory building, and we're um, exceeding the allowable floor, the gross floor area and the height, so the uh, application is for minor variance to allow for this existing condition. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any questions by committee members to the agent? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience here to speak on this application? Seeing none, staff, would you like to weigh in with your comments, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the existing um, detached garage that will be converted to an accessory structure as proposed has been on the property since about 1965. Um, the property is within the mature neighborhood uh, policies and provisions of the city, and as a result of that, a site plan application has been filed, and the variances arose through um, the review of the site plan application with respect to an increase in the maximum permitted uh, floor area and also an increase with respect to the maximum permitted uh, building height. So staff have evaluated the application based on the four tests as prescribed under the Planning Act, and staff is recommending uh, approval of the application with the following conditions. One, that the accessory structure not be used as a second dwelling unit. <clears throat> Two, that no other accessory structure shall be permitted on the property. Three, that no commercial or industrial uses shall operate from the accessory structure. Uh, four, that tree protection measures to the satisfaction of the Public Works and Engineering Department landscaping section shall be approved in conjunction with the associated site plan application SP17-009. And finally, five, that failure to comply with and maintain the conditions of the committee will render the approval null and void. So just a quick question. On the proposed garage down the road, it will be on the adjacent, it will be t attached to the home, obviously, um, or from what this diagram looks. Will there be access to the backyard, vehicular access, or is that just landscapes? Um, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, no, there will not be vehicular access okay. to the to the rear yard. There is an area that's set aside that would would run along uh, parallel to the um, uh, westerly property line that would allow equipment and, and, and persons to move back and forth, but not uh, vehicles. Okay, but that's just what I wanted to just verify. That's fine. So, sir, um, those conditions put forward by staff, do you agree, understand and agree to those conditions? I do. Okay. Any questions by committee members? Seeing none, seeking a motion to proceed. Motion to approve. Seconded by Mr. Crouch. All in favor? That carries. That is approved, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Recalling application A18021, Eugene Kelt CU and Nora Vejiva. The property is located at 89 Huntingwood Crescent. Um, committee members, how would we like to deal with this application? Staff, is there any, uh, I guess I, we've read your recommendations. We either, I guess, Ms. Myers, just for clarity, have the option to defer the application or hear out the application? That is correct, sir. Committee members? Uh, Thoughts? My, uh, my I, I would like to defer this application. Okay. There could be some emergency or something. Yeah, I understand. I mean, family or agent. An initial deferral. I mean, uh, <coughs> we don't know the circumstances, but again, we have the options to do both. So, motion to defer by Mr. Chatta. Second. Seconded by Mr. Nurse. All Sorry. in favor? Sorry, is this indefinite or? You I put mean, you at you. Yeah, so that's why I was. Yeah. Gonna ask. Uh, Staff. Staff, indefinite deferral would work in this case? Or? Uh, I'm assuming it does. Uh, I, uh, I haven't received any communication from the applicant as to why they're not here. Um, but uh, uh, indefinite works in terms of potentially uh, dates not working out for them, uh, perhaps in terms of work or whatever it is. So uh, perhaps making it indefinite so that they, they are able to choose which date to come back. Okay. So uh, that would be completed through the Secretary of Treasurer. Uh, I'd ask uh, Jeannie to respond to that. Through you, Mr. Uh, through you, member, I did um, email a copy of the report to the uh, owners of the property. I've not received a response. So my motion is indefinite uh, deferral. Deferral. Seconded by Mr. Nurse. All in favor? That carries. Mr. Coach, just for, did you? Uh, okay. Yeah, understood. Understood. Okay. Uh, if there is no further business, seeking a motion to adjourn. By Mr. Crouch, seconded by Mr. Chatta. All in favor? That carries. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.